pleased to be with you. Turns out this is going to be a flash talk, and uh, my colleague and uh, teletransport expert, Philip Skogstad, at the back of the room, assigned the job of dragging me away at a certain minute. So let's see how I do. No PowerPoint. What I want to share with you today is entirely personal. It comes after 40 years of human-robot interaction research, and it starts with an epiphany last May when I discovered. that the robot and the human have to be a team. The context that drove this realization was the car as a robot and the human as a driver. And the auto industry is paying us very well to measure the emotions of the driver. They want to know your emotional state, your attention state, your distraction state, whether you can be trusted to drive again in the next 10 seconds. Because just maybe this perfect autonomous car isn't perfect. Or maybe the conditions in which it's operating are suddenly not planned for. So this became the beginning of the epiphany. I'll be damned. <coughs> Car's a robot. In the midst of that was the realization that's a robot. I've been observing the crowd. Most of you have one or two robots with you. Some have more. I don't see them all. And the point is, it's not a phone. It's not a laptop. It's not a car. They're all robots. And that's a big deal. So the car industry is paying us to better understand how these guys should interact with each other. We've been looking at three different ways in which robots and people can interact with each other. And the one here, I'll label information. And that's totally expected. We've been doing that for decades. It's easy. Send information to each other. The one in the middle here is called emotions. And the assertion is we need a dialogue. And today, the car industry, again, paying me good money to measure your emotions. And we're doing that. Physiologically, facial expression, body language, voicing, all of those are being used. And uh, the machine interpretation is getting relatively good. The problem is the damn machine has no emotions. And if we're going to have a relationship, you and I, we're going to exchange emotions. That's the number one measure of a relationship. And since this robot doesn't have them, I can't trust him. I'm not sure he can trust me, even if he's reading my emotions. And that becomes a major issue for me. And then we have what I'll say is knowledge. And we need a dialogue. What's the difference between knowledge and information? Working definition today is, what's it mean? A display came, comes up and says 3.2 miles. So what? Well, it means we'll never make it because we're out of electricity. So the argument there now is we have to implement all three channels simultaneously all the time. And from 30 years of research on human teamwork, we know that knowledge exchange is the most difficult aspect of working with people. We know from working with human teams that the very best predictor of team performance is emotion exchange. Believe it or not, it's not how good your tech is or how good your business analytics are. It's how you've exchanged emotions with each other 
predicts team performance better than anything else. Information, yeah, we're pretty good at that. We'll keep doing it. Now, why is this a big deal? Partly because this human thing, I better change to red. Now it's getting serious. complex adaptive system. You're not surprised. The big word is complexity. Cheat sheet not needed anymore. The issue is this damn robot is now a complex adaptive system. And the big word is adaptive. So it's sucking in information. It's making inferences. Algorithms are predicting things. Two complex adaptive systems trying to work with each other. That's teamwork. That's not easy. On the bottom side of the diagram, we run into one more complex. Adaptive system, which is called social. So most things in human behavior are defined by our social relationships. <coughs> good behavior, good etiquette, polite, the driver who's a bastard, the, the driver who's too hesitant to make sense of. <coughs> so these, this complex system sets our expectations and our intentions. So should this robot car have intentions? Should it have expectations? If it has either, how's it going to communicate it to us? That's the big one. And then, how am I doing time-wise? Keep moving fast. Some of you Siri, do we have a date tonight? One possibility nearby is Frost Amphitheater, her response. Usually she tells me there are several restaurants nearby. That's actually not the response I want, is it? I want to know if we've got a date. <laughs> May I use you as my stage mate here? <laughs> okay. The second epiphany happened to me about two months later, reading an article in the New York Times. I strongly urge you to read it. It comes with the title, To Siri with Love. It's approximately December 2014. So who would write to Siri a love message? Well, it turns out it's the mother of a 13-year-old autistic boy. And the mother is sharing her struggle to have a relationship to her own child. If any of you have been in the child-raising space, you know this is one of the most terrifying threats that you get told about uh, as you uh, get ready for a birthing. And it's a very profound disorder for the child, for the parent, for the family, for the siblings, and it's a neural structural failure. So it's not likely we're going to reprogram it. But the point is, all these damn robots are autistic. And the more you relate to them, the more autistic you're going to be. We've had several people observe that when you're around robots, you start behaving more like the robots. That's like social behavior. You mimic the things and the people around you. And so the message could be terrifying, but that's not my intention. The message is we have a new set of design requirements. So anybody in the audience who's designing, building, implementing media, my challenge to you is you must go forward designing systems robots that can relate to us, 
in the sense that they're intelligible to us with information dialogue, emotion dialogue, knowledge dialogue, and a keen awareness that all three of these major players are complex, adaptive, changing. It's a huge transformation on that 40 years of research I claim to be involved in. I was busy building stuff. I was busy being a good engineer. Later, I was focused almost entirely on human behavior and trying to figure out hu how humans work together effectively. We made a lot of progress on that. And it points back to emotions is the main determinant of human performance. And knowledge exchange is one of the most difficult things to do day to day, moment to moment, including telling you what I don't know. And on a longer version of this talk, I would give more examples that you've probably had with your navigation system. You're headed to grandmother's house. Nav system tells you to take the next off ramp. You're saying, what the hell, that's not the way to grandma's house. Can you ask the nav system why? No. The next day, you're on the way to grandma's house again, and you take the exit. And can the nav system ask you why? No. You took the exit because you need to pee. How does the car know about that stuff? Another human driver would know and understand Robots don't know about that stuff. We've got to build them differently next time. With that, I think I'd like to pause, and maybe with a little comment that I wanted to share at the beginning, uh, because my uh, colleague Philip has told me to say this. If you're in here to innovate, and I'm saying innovation is a desperate requirement here, you need three things. Not just two today, Philip. You need freedom to innovate. We academics have lots of freedom to do, study anything we want. We need money. Any of you have money? Send it. <laughs> <laughs> and you need an insight. And what I'm experiencing and trying to share with you is these are the two biggest insights I've lived through in 40 years of academic research. All that stuff I built turned out it was a, a robot. And everything that happens in my graduate class is industry inviting us to build robots for them. And the big driver is the car because it's, the, it's the, by far the biggest dragon in your closet. It's the only robot that goes 130 miles an hour and can kill you in any given next 100 milliseconds. So it, the price of that piece of robot is, has become extreme. And be assured, the industry is very eagerly trying to sell it to you. And with that, I should pause. And I